Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our next installment of the National Weather Service's Climate Services Seminar Series. Uh, we're very happy today to have uh, Dr. John Nielsen Gammon, who we will introduce in just one second. Um, but again, we're very happy to have you here this afternoon. Uh, we appreciate you taking time out of your day uh, to listen to this uh, webinar with these exciting updates. Uh, just to note, we will be recording this. Um, so this uh, is a recorded webinar that we will post. And so we encourage you to share this with your colleagues as you're able, uh, and we'll send out uh, via the listserv uh, the recording will be posted where we post all of the climate services uh, webinars. Uh, one last note before I turn it over to Victor Murphy to introduce our guest uh, is uh, please, uh, let's try to save questions for the end, or you can put them in the question box throughout the talk, and I will moderate the, any question and answers we have at the end. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started, and I will turn it over now to Victor Murphy from Southern Region. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um... I'd like to reiterate what Stephen said. Thank you for joining us. Um, Dr. John Nielsen Gadman is a Regents Professor at Texas A&M University. He's also the Director of the Southern Regional Climate Center there in College Station, and he's also the Texas State Climatologist. Uh, Dr. NG, as we lovingly call him, grew up in Northern California and went to school uh, in, Ma in Massachusetts, receiving a PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT, in 1990. Uh, Dr. NG joined the faculty of Texas A&M University in 1991, and he was appointed the Texas State Climatologist by then Governor George W. Bush uh, back in 2000. Um, so Texas, we do have a good uh, traceability document here to uh, document the fact that John is our state climatologist here. Uh, John became director of the SRCC, or the Southern Regional Climate Center, in 2021. He is now also serving a two-year term as president of the AASC, or American Association of State Climatologists. Dr. Nielsen Gammons also conducts research on large scale and local scale, scale weather, climate and air pollution with a focus on intense rainfalls and droughts. And he also teaches courses in weather forecasting, analysis, climate, climate change and computer modeling. And for any of y'all uh, A&M graduates out there, I'm sure you all had Dr. NG either in your undergraduate uh, days there at A&M or in Aggieland or your graduate days there. So without further ado, John, I'll kick it over to you. Everyone should have his, uh, uh, I guess, homepage on there or his title screen, introduction screen. And go ahead, John. Thank you. Yeah, Victor, thank you. Thanks for the, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, and uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm happy to, to talk about what's going on right now with the Southern Regional Climate Center. Uh, first off, I want to give a little bit of background on the Southern Regional Climate Center because it's a bit different from other regional climate centers. We share the same basic um, mission statement um, provided by uh, NCEI, which is uh, we provide, along with the other regional climate centers, sector specific and value added products and services. Um, every regional climate center has one or two areas of emphasis. Um, ours are uh, water supply and coastal resiliency. Uh, but as you'll see, we're, we're looking to expand beyond beyond those two emphases to add uh, at least one other. Um, we also, uh, along with other RCCs, provide uh, computer infrastructure for providing climate information um, through um, the, 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 the foundation being ACES, but then a variety of products and tools which are uh, unique among the different RCCs, and I'll show you a few of ours. And of course, we since we're outside of no, it's fairly easy for us to integrate data um, from NOAA and non-NOAA sources in the in the products and services we provide. So we are actually a consortium of three institutions here within the SRCC. Uh, the first is the College of Arts and Sciences, which includes um, the Department of Atmospheric Sciences, which houses the Texas State Climatologist, and also uh, Texas Sea Grant, who we've uh, partnered with for um, the focus on coastal resiliency, since Texas's coast is a large fraction of the um, SRCC region, which spans from Texas to Mississippi, and then up north from Oklahoma to Tennessee. and. Uh, Sea Grant, of course, is pretty well interconnected uh, cooperation among the different state level 
uh, Sea Grant institutions. Um, our particular team, uh, part time and full time, uh, but I guess it's all part time in various fashions. Uh, I'd list four people uh, myself, uh, VJ, Demolina, and Allison. Um, so you heard you heard what I do, where I am. Um, BJ is um, effectively the number two person in the SRCC in terms of providing climate services. He's also actually the newest person. He joined uh, the faculty at Texas A&M in the uh, beginning of December. So he's been around for uh, almost three weeks now. He comes to us from uh, Michigan State University. Uh, where he got a PhD in geography under the state climatologist there, Jeff Andreessen. And he also has experience working uh, with the High Plains Regional Climate Center, as well as uh, the Great Lakes Integrated Science and Assessment. Um, so he's got vast experience in climate services, and uh, his particular background interests include uh, extreme rainfall and um, agriculture applications. For climate services. Debolina is our point of contact with Texas Sea Grant, where she has the position of Coastal Resilience Program Manager. Um, her background is actually in chemical engineering, and she been involved with uh, been a, did a fellowship with the EPA and was also uh, Assistant Director of uh, an Energy Research Institute here at the Texas Engineering Experiment Station. Um, so she has a background in a variety of coastal issues. So she's uh, wonderful to have on our team. And uh, also been with us nearly from the start, Allison Tarter, who's a research associate, um, who uh, has a master's degree from Texas State University in biology. Uh, she did her um, thesis work on freshwater mussels. So that ties in water supply and coastal issues as well as impacts. And um, her focus was on coastal mussels and you know, freshwater mussels in southeast Texas. But partway through her research work, we had uh, something called Hurricane Harvey uh, really uh, do a number on the ecology down there. So uh, her focus pre pretty quickly shifted to looking at uh, resiliency and recovery from extreme events among aquatic ecosystems. And uh, so, um, originally a biologist, now interested in climate as well because of the obvious impacts on that. So it's a nice uh, broad team that we have, and that's just one of the components. Uh, second component is the Texas A&M Transportation Institute, which is uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, transportation applied research institutes in the world. It does research around the world as well, and is involved in everything from uh, engineering to policy to um, infrastructure. And uh, our person at TTI is Jim Klein. Uh, he's actually the project manager for the SRCC. I'll talk a little bit about more him in a moment. Uh, first, uh, our third partner is Trabus Technologies. So they are our, um, basically our IT component. Um, most um, RCCs do their IT work in-house. Um, I, I know my way around the computer in terms of programming, but I would be quite frightened about having to share any of the code I wrote uh, with uh, someone over in the computer science department because it would be um, quite disastrous uh, to, to get their unfettered opinion. So uh, we knew we wanted to have uh, people who knew what they were doing with uh, data science and programming. And so this gives us also the flexibility of being able to draw upon a larger uh, pool of programmers so we can do focused uh, intensive work and then uh, shift into maintenance. And David Satiraj is uh, heading up the group there that's uh, part of the SICC. So Jim Klein, as I mentioned, with uh, TTI is a uh, civil engineer who has uh, several decades of experience at uh, uh, public works and transportation at the local and regional level within the state of Texas. And uh, he has seen uh, firsthand with uh, 
working on uh, working with the uh, Texas National Guard with evacuations in Beaumont during Hurricane Harvey, um, the importance of climate to uh, transportation, both uh, regular operations and disruptions. Uh, David Satcharaj um, comes to us uh, and came to Trabus after being at LSU for many years, where he was actually the director of data science. And uh, he developed or helped develop many of the products that are part of the SRCC. Um, the SRC itself was at LSU for almost all of its existence up until 2021 when uh, it shifted over here to Texas A&M. So it's actually very good to have uh, someone with the institutional knowledge uh, for the SRCC to uh, make for a relatively seamless transition. Um, LSU also uh, was a very instrumental in, in being able to, to uh, transfer everything from there to here without any disruption of climate services. Okay, that's, a, that's enough background, I think. Let's talk about uh, some of the products that we have that are either new or of interest, and then talk about some of the developing development work and products and research for the area for, for climate services. So uh, first one here is our um, storm surge tracker. Um, this relies pretty heavily on um, well, um, products initially developed through the Southern Climate Impacts Planning Program. And what it shows is the, the track of selected hurricanes in real time, as well as the um, sea level gauge readings uh, along the coast in real time also. So except for obvious things like power outages and gauges being washed away, uh, it's possible using this tool to to track the progression of uh, sea level during storm surge events um, wherever they occur within the United States. The particular gauges being highlighted are ones that are close to the, the track of the storm that are subjects of storm surge. And here I'm showing an example from uh, Hurricane Ian. It's possible to go look back uh, at some uh, at recent storms as well as using this for uh, real-time monitoring of uh, land falling tropical storms and hurricanes. Next product I want to mention is our storm reports product, uh, which takes all of the um, storm reports that uh, come in from the weather service that uh, get uh, collected at the Storm Prediction Center and uh, makes it available in a fairly handy format. So it's possible to uh, select reports for a particular date, it's possible to select reports for a particular uh, locality. It's possible to highlight things from a particular state and month. Here in this example, we're looking at the, uh, let's call it the traditional uh, severe storm categories, hail, tornado, and uh, high winds during the, uh, during November 30th of uh, this year, which uh, was the second day of a major severe weather outbreak across the Southern United States. And the map allows for the lo location of all of the events. And then below the map is a table that has a complete listing of the events along with the, 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 the narrative text that goes along with it. And it's possible to sort this by time or by storm type or by uh, the magnitude of the event. For hail, that would be the, the diameter of the hailstone. For wind, it would be the wind speed, if wind speed was known, for example. Um, so that's a, that's a handy tool for looking at past um, severe weather outbreaks all across the United States. Um, another tool we have, which is kind of handy, is our extremes tool. This is based upon um, airport weather observations. So it's using um, hourly stations rather than co-op stations, but it's uh, it displays the record values for the selected um, time, whether it's a day or month or year, 
here I've selected the record lowest temperature for the month of December, uh, focusing on uh, the central United States here. Uh, of course, there are different periods of record for each of the uh, stations here, so you can sort of pick out the lowest values to find the stations with the longest period of record. Uh, College Station, for example, uh, got down to uh, two degrees back in December of 1989. Fortunately, it looks like we're not going to get down that cold uh, with the cold air outbreak that's coming here on Thursday and Friday. Um, stations nearby, uh, those are those are airports that um, had um, ASOS stations put in by the Texas Department of Transportation uh, back in um, 1990s or 2000s. And so they missed that event and their records are typically in the uh, low to mid 20s. So there's a dramatic gap between how cold it can get here and how cold it's gotten here recently. So uh, um, fortunately or not, we've seen serious cold down here relatively recently back in February, 2021, but this is gonna be fairly unusual for so early in the year. And uh, you can scan other parts of the region to see what records might be uh, threatened by this upcoming event. All right, another tool that we, um, basically had the technology for, but uh, fairly rapidly spun it up is uh, our Inland Waterways and Drought Tool. Um, Travis Technologies has done a lot of work with uh, monitoring of water levels and barge and shipping traffic and so forth. And so when the um, water levels in the Mississippi got started getting low enough to be causing major impacts. Um, David and his team developed uh, a tool to combine uh, drought information with uh, water levels. So um, since 95% of the lower Mississippi River is part of our region, we figured this was uh, sort of our responsibility. We, really, we need to expand the, the drought monitoring to include the rest of the river basin. But this uh, includes uh, not just the map, but you can click on individual stations to get station information and time series, or you can uh, examine the, the table for historical comparisons. So for example, back in the middle of October, uh, which was near the, the peak of the crisis, um, Memphis's gauge was at uh, minus 8.96 feet below the zero reference level. Uh, which was 14 feet or so below the minimum in 2021 and was uh, slightly below the minimum in 2012, which was the last time we had really low levels. And you can see St. Louis and Greenville, Mississippi also made it below the 2012 values, whereas Baton Rouge, at least as of uh, mid-October, had not uh, dropped below the, the 2012 value. Um, more recently, here's uh, here's the latest update. We don't see any more short-term drought across the uh, any of the southern region, and we also see the the gauge heights doing much better. Uh, they are for the most part comparable to or higher than where they were this time of year in 2021, and um, for the most part, again, doing much better than they were back in 2012, even though they're they're all still running uh, below their typical values for this time of year. Okay, and complementary to that, uh, you saw drought uh, colorations on the map for October. We've circled back to that. Um, those that information is available across the United States generically through our uh, drought tool. So this is this is not um, NCEI NCEI uh, uh, official Inclim Div Climate Division data. Um, this is organized by Climate Division, but we basically are 
have taken a step back in technology um, for reasons I'll explain in a minute. Um, the the Inclim Div is a step forward because it does a nice comprehensive spatial analysis of uh, conditions uh, within the climate division, taking into account topography and all sorts of other stuff. Um, and it's available um, several days after the uh, beginning of the month. Um, but um, we wanted to have a tool available that basically lets us uh, track something resembling the climate division values in near real time. So this is a tool that's updated on a daily basis using whatever data is available from the climate divisions. And it's a straightforward averaging of, of those conditions. So um, even though it's not going to perfectly align with the official climate division numbers at the end of the month, it gives a sense of where things are uh, in the middle of the month uh, on these rolling 30-day uh, or 60-day or 90-day time scales. Okay, now I want to turn to products that are under development. So first off, a drought and reservoir tool. So the idea here is to bring in um, observations of reservoir levels, uh, some of which are fairly readily available online and some of which are not. Um, but then to complement that with a um, forecasting tool, much like what Trebus has already developed for forecasting uh, water levels in uh, Mississippi River and other navigable waterways. So the idea here is to um, basically look at the um, constraints, the, the, the best or worst case scenarios for a given reservoir. So based upon historical conditions and historical management, um, how long would drought have to continue? How long lack of rain uh, to cause uh, the reservoir to uh, effectively go dry? Or conversely, um, analogous to how much rain is required to, to get the Hummer drought index to near normal, how much rain would be required to either bring a reservoir back up to normal storage levels during a drought, or uh, if that's not the concern, uh, how much would be necessary to basically uh, fill the reservoir and, and require uh, something like uh, uncontrolled releases from the reservoir. So this would be a tool for um, water managers and emergency managers to understand um, how, how close uh, the reservoir and the reservoir system is to, to reaching uh, either the upper or lower end of its uh, operating range. Also, um, the integrated water portal, which is something that originated in the tool that was developed at Texas A&M, and then we partnered with NC State to um, go live and operational with it because we didn't have the IT support for it. Uh, well, now we do. Um, and so NC State has, has ceased any development work on it. Um, you can still access their product through the legacy website. Um, but meanwhile, we're um, taking it over. We've, we've redone the code and we're upgrading the statistics and uh, adding some improvements to the graphical interface also. So this is a, a we're going to look focus on the, the drought monitoring part of their integrated water portal, which includes standard uh, precipitation and precipitation derived products, including one that we originated here called the SPI blend, which is effectively uh, a blend of SPIs at several time scales, which gets around the problem of uh, precipitation being part of the window for the SPI and then one day Eventually, it just sort of drops off the edge and there's a drastic change in conditions. Well, the, the soil, soils and the streams don't respond that way. They can respond suddenly to rainfall that comes in, but then they gradually dry out. So the SPI blend is an attempt to mimic uh, 
basically translate the precipitation history into something that's more relevant to um, to actual drought conditions. Um, and so we're uh, we're working on statistics for longer term uh, drought uh, because there were some weird things with the original tool. So we're working on refining that and uh, um, we'll be adding improvements as as we go along as well. But uh, we're looking to have this uh, uh, publicly available um, sometime in the next uh, two or three months. Okay, moving on to uh, some applied climate services research going on in the SRCC. Uh, first off, um, I mentioned uh, we we're interested in a focus area beyond uh, water supply and coastal resilience. Well, you know, since Texas A&M Transportation Institute's one of our components, transportation is an obvious uh, uh, focus area, one that's presently not represented among the regional climate centers. And so the first uh, project we're working on along those lines is integrating uh, climate data and weather data with uh, crash data. So we've got crash reports that are available for all significant accidents that take place, anything beyond a, just a fender bender, uh, but they include maybe a one or two sentence summary of the weather. It might be the weather that was present when the first responder got there rather than the weather that was present when the crash occurred. And there are a lot of different aspects of the weather that are relevant to potential uh, increasing or decreasing the probability of an accident, such as precipitation, visibility, temperature, uh, the angle of the sun uh, can be can be very critical. So uh, as a test case, we collected data for um, about 4,000 crashes involving vehicles and pedestrians. Um, thinking that perhaps the sun angle would be um, one of the important issues. And uh, we're analyzing that data. And uh, next step will be to expand this out to uh, um, other crashes and also have the data set available uh, for other people to work on. Uh, another bit of research that's been going on here, which is basically a continuation of something we started um, under the Office of the State Climatologist, but expanding to more regionally relevant information, is uh, some work on extreme precipitation. So um, right now we have um, things like 100-day rainfall event and so forth. Um, the official numbers are um, housed within what's called NOAA Atlas 14. Uh, but NOAA Atlas 14 is a, um, uses a what's called a stationary analysis. It just assumes that um, any, any event could have happened in any given year with, with basically equal probability. So it's, it doesn't assume the climate's changing. It doesn't assume the odds of extreme precipitation are changing. So um, we were interested in investigating a couple aspects of that. First off, uh, exploring ways of measuring and detecting that uh, climate change. Um, and secondly, seeing what sort of impact that's had on places that haven't had a recent update to NOAA Atlas 14. Uh, the way the updates work is basically consortia of states get together and pool their money and fund, uh, fund NOAA to do the analysis. And the most recent one was in Texas in 2018. So that's fairly up to date. But by contrast, most of the Southern and Southeastern United States was done in 2011. And the Carolinas was part of the Eastern analysis was done back in 2001. So uh, there's been a lot of weather since then. And there's also been a lot of climate change since then, which could mean the numbers might need updating. Anyhow, to, to do this analysis, we started by creating composite uh, time series in each county, uh, which 
is uh, uses the um, longest period of record station whenever it's available. Then it uses the longest period of record station that fills in the gaps in the first station and so forth. Uh, trying to build up as long and homogeneous a record as possible back all the way to 1890. And uh, we have that for most of the counties in the region. Uh, we limited our analysis to places where the stations within a county ought to be relatively interchangeable. And that turns out to be mostly true. I'll show you where it's not in a moment. Uh, in any event, um, this is what you get for the magnitude of the change from 1980 to 2020. Um, the way we measured the change is by looking at the statistics and fitting that to the, the change in global mean surface temperature, so a measure of overall climate change magnitude. It turns out that with our data record, 1980 is about the time when that, when that uh, estimate lines up with what you get from a stationary estimate, assuming no climate change. So this simultaneously tells us how much things have changed in the past 40 years, and the same numbers tell us how much of a difference doing a non-stationary analysis, non analysis makes for current conditions. So um, more greens than yellows here. So most places have experienced an increase in the statistical probability of extreme rainfall. But this is a fairly noisy map because a lot depends on what happens in a particular location. So next plot uh, regionalizes it and it's still somewhat noisy. You can see general patterns like uh, bigger increases in East Texas and Western Louisiana, big increase in Eastern Carolinas, uh, smaller increases elsewhere. Uh, but if you look at climate model output and, and average a bunch of models together, you get a smoother pattern. There's, there's no particular reason, for example, why climate change should cause a big increase of rainfall in, in central Louisiana and have almost no effect in southwestern Mississippi, right? This is a combination of climate change and natural or random variability. So to try to extract the climate change signal, we did analysis over the whole region and over the Gulf Coast and Southeast subregions. And this is the magnitude of the trend in terms of percent increase of rainfall intensity for two year and 100 year storms from 1980 to 2020. And the error bars are showing the 95% confidence interval, which is, which is spans basically the, almost the entire plausible range. Uh, but it's clearly greater than zero for, uh, focus on the green dots for now, clearly greater than zero for both the uh, less extreme events that occur on average once every two years and more extreme events that occur on average once every 100 years seems to be a uh, greater increase in the intensity of the rarer events, which is consistent with other research that's gone on. Um, see a similar thing for the Gulf Coast. Southeast is a small enough area in our analysis that the error bars are, are too large to, to conclude that it's definitively increasing, uh, but um, the trends are consistent or even perhaps larger than they are uh, in the Gulf Coast region. And the second purpose was to look at how important um, having uh, these last 20 years worth of data is. And so this is the what you get. Basically, if you did the Atlas 14 analysis in 2000, compared to what you get if you did it with data all the way through the year 2019. And so, for example, Houston area, Southeast Texas got in Hurricane Harvey and a few other things. So the estimates have gone up there. Uh, they've gone down in places that have been luckier that haven't gotten heavy rain. In the Carolinas, we see increases there with things like Hurricane Matthew and a few others. Um, so, uh, that area really is in need of an update. The 100-year 
single day rainfall is probably underestimated by NOAA S14 by, by one to two inches in coastal regions of North and South Carolina. Now I'll mention that in that the NOAA is moving in the direction of doing non-stationary analyses, uh, sort of in the same vein that we've done it, although with a different methodology, and we're going to be uh, independently doing some work to to see how much of a difference uh, these different techniques make, uh, so we can understand um, which one might be more appropriate. So um, I've highlighted a few of our products, um, a few of the things that are in the pipeline, and some of the research that's been going on here. Uh, all of our products are available on our website at srcc.tamu.edu. If you're working with a product and you 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 want something done differently or improved or what have you, or even a new product that you can't find anywhere else, please uh, contact me, drop me a line, or what have you. Um, as I mentioned, our mission is to provide climate services. We want to do it the best way possible. And uh, um, your part of part of what you do is uh, the same thing. And so we want to help you in in uh, meeting the needs of everybody. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation again, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, John. This was really good stuff. And um, thanks again for your, your remarks there at the end. You know, our, our regional climate centers are really great partners for us, not only at the national regional level, but also for our local offices. And, and uh, you, know, you being here today, I think uh, demonstrates the, kind of the great climate service um, that you can help us provide here in the weather service. So I see um, we don't have any questions in yet. So come. So if you want to either raise your hand, I can unmute you, or you can drop your question into the question box here. Uh, while we're waiting for some of those questions, hopefully to come in, I, I do want to ask a question, John. I was really intrigued by um, if you, uh, one of the new initiatives you discussed was looking at uh, the climatology, climate related to accidents. And I think that was really interesting. The transportation, yeah, this transportation crash data and climate data. Um, do, do you, if you can, who, at, at what levels of like transportation offices have you coordinated with? Have you discussed, um, have you worked on this with like the, the federal department of transportation level or the state level only? I, I'm curious only because I think this is really interesting and in the weather service we're moving toward impact based uh, products and services across the board, weather and climate and transportation is a big one. And to see and when I was in the winter program, we looked at this talked about this a lot from the perspective of understanding how winter weather affects uh, uh, traffic uh, and transportation in general, uh, that being a major impact. But the climate linkage here is fascinating. I'm just kind of curious, you know, what the what kind of the sphere of influence was on, on, on the data that you were using and whether or not you were able to get data from multiple states or the feds and, and you know, how you were able to piece that together. Yeah, sure. Um, well, right now, it's basically a pilot project. So, um, this is this is data from the state of Texas that we had ready access to, and really the idea here is um, to um, explore and demonstrate the value of this merger because we we see a lot of a lot of promise in that for you know included for some of the reasons you outlined um, as well as you know direct improvement in transportation safety. So um, I think the time for working with other partners in this is going to be maybe a year or two down the road as we start being able to see, uh, you know, uh, important uh, recurring features re regarding the, the weather at the time of accidents and compared to uh, ordinary weather conditions and explore some of the things that can be done to improve traffic safety. Okay, that, that, that's great, John. So I just you know, I look forward to seeing any results and, and any of the progress you guys make on that, because that's that's something I, I think would be of really great interest, not in, you know, to a variety of, of folks, and, and the weather service certainly included in that. So that that's exciting. All right. So do we have? I still have any questions coming in the box? I don't see any hands up. Um, anything else, uh, Victor? Do you want to say anything or um, jump yeah, in? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, John. I was wondering if you could maybe on your uh, screen there, I guess, since you have control of the screen, can maybe show the homepage of the SRCC and maybe perhaps show folks how to, how to navigate it real quick and how to find some of the products that you, uh, you know, showed us about today? 
Okay, yeah, we have to do that. Um, let's see, let me go ahead and uh, switch the window I'm highlighting. So this is the SICC homepage. Um, each product has its own uh, window. So um, the, the products that are for the most part shown here are um, sort of spatially integrated products. A um, lot of what you might do for, um, so the storm report product there, um we've got uh climate normals displayer our search trackers here uh the tool for looking at hourly observations of individual stations uh, there's the extremes and so on um now we also have tools i didn't talk about for looking at data for individual stations and most of that's access to our climate data portal um probably uh probably y'all have uh memorized all the important uh, climate uh, station IDs for your own uh, locations. Uh, if not, we have a search tool for looking for uh, stations within a given radius and so forth. That's that's that one over there. But in terms of the climate data portal, that's where a lot of the uh, weather nerd type products are. So we've got um, abilities to uh, plot data, daily, monthly, seasonal data, uh, threshold exceedances, um, graph uh, precipitation, climatology, and so forth, um, and uh, look, at, uh, look at a bunch of stuff in that regard. So if you're looking for individual station data access, it's sort of complementary to SCASIS, um, the, the climate data portal is the place to go to but those the rest of our products are all accessible directly from our web page yeah john so follow-up question if you can click on the monthly graphs i mean that, this to me is a really very useful tool for anyone doing kind of presentation so i guess a couple of requests i guess if possible uh the moving average there you know the blue line which is great is that a five-year or ten-year moving average uh, that is, let's see. That is a seven year moving average. Okay. Yeah, and also, I guess maybe some uh, on the request side, it would it be possible to lump in together, I think, for the months, uh, like say by season? So you have on, on your left hand side on the drop down menu, you got individual months. Mm -hmm. um would it be possible to do like a yearly one or perhaps maybe seasonal yeah we could do that seasonal and yearly sure cool thank you see that's how easy it is to get a re request into the src yeah i know i've been meaning to ask you that for a while but i'll do it now while i got you thank you john yeah thank you Okay, great. Thanks for your question, Victor. Thanks, uh, John. No other uh, questions are, are popping in here. Um, so I, I hope that the folks online found this helpful today. Um, certainly, uh, John would should be happy to, to get in touch and, and work with you. If you, you said, like he said, if you have any uh, questions or, or ways that they can help, uh, I know they'd be happy to. So I um, will sh we'll share this uh, once it's posted to the YouTube channel for all of our climate services webinars. I invite you to share this with your colleagues and other staff who, who may not have had an opportunity to join us today. Um, and we hope that you, you learned something and, and are, are, are even more motivated to uh, use some of these tools in your climate services uh, and your climate IDSS provision. Um, so uh, uh, Dr. nielsen Gam, thank you again for your time today. And um, with no other questions coming in right now, uh, I'll, I'll send you off and wish you a happy holiday. And thanks again for your time today. And thanks, Victor, for uh, joining us and providing the introduction.